My name is Rachel Rizzo. I'm a senior fellow with the Europe Center at the Atlantic Council and pleased to welcome you all here this afternoon. Uh, we are here uh, at an event co-hosted by New America and Nordic West, and this afternoon we are hosting an extremely timely panel on Ukraine and the future of NATO, a new era in transatlantic collective defense. Last year, since Russia's illegal and unjustified invasion of Ukraine, the way that we think about security uh, has been completely transformed, especially when it comes to the transatlantic alliance and European security in general. The post-Cold War consensus that borders could not be or should not be redrawn by force has been shattered. There's instability in the region and the norms and institutions that have underpinned European security since the end of the Cold War are immensely strained. But there's another side of that coin that we've seen as well. The invasion of Ukraine has reinvigorated NATO, and we've welcomed a new member in Finland, and we hope to welcome a new member, Sweden, in short order, but we'll see how that goes. Um, something Putin wanted less of. Putin wanted less of NATO, but he got more of it, and that just shows how important this alliance is to transatlantic security and unity. The U.S. and Europe are still deeply committed to supporting Ukraine, and for now, transatlantic unity seems to be holding strong. Another thing that has, I'm sure, surprised Putin and Moscow over the last year and three months at this point. For the next hour, we're going to discuss the political and strategic implications of the war in Ukraine, as well as the challenges and opportunities it presents for NATO's collective defense mission. And we have the perfect panel to have this in-depth discussion. First, I'd like to welcome Colonel Yua Hele, Finland's defense, military, naval, and air attaché to the United States and Canada. Welcome. We have Ingrid Ask, the Minister Counselor and Deputy Chief of Mission at the Embassy of Sweden here in Washington, D.C. Welcome. Uh, Marta Kepe, who is a Senior Defense Analyst at the RAND Corporation, and Dr. Angela Stent, a Senior Advisor to the Center for Eurasian, Russian, and East European Studies, and Professor Emerita of Government and Foreign Service at Georgetown University, as well as a non-resident Senior Fellow at the Brookings Institution. We also have our moderator, Candice Rondeau, Director of the Future Frontline Initiative and Planetary Politics Initiative here at New America. And with that, Candice, I will hand it over to you to kick off the panel. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Um, it's really good to be here. It's actually, a, uh, for me, an honor to be sitting alongside um, all of these great thinkers and doers in the world of security, um, democracy, and the protection of human rights. Um, each in our own way, I think we all kind of have been thinking over the last year about what that means. Um, uh, you know, we've, we've tended to think about it as an abstraction uh, until uh, the, the beginning of the latest phase of hostilities between Russia and Ukraine. Uh, but we have seen unfold on social media, on camera. Uh, we've heard the voices of the victims uh, in Ukraine. Uh, we've seen the suffering also, I would like to say, I would like to note of Russians who've courageously stood up uh, and uh, said no to Putin's aggression. Uh, and I don't think we should forget them. But most importantly, of course, uh, this has greatly affected our understanding of collective security for the transatlantic alliance. It has transformed once again, relationships between the United States, uh, between Europe, uh, and with the Nordic uh, nations. And we are at a very historic inflection point. So we're going to talk a little bit about that today um, and kind of dive in a little bit. So I'm not going to sugarcoat this. I, I could sort of start with the hard one, which is what about Gotland? But I think we'll get to that <laughs> a little bit later. That's a little bit obscure. We're, we're going to start with, um, I think, just a simple question that's been on our mind uh, here at New America which is, you know, how should we be thinking about the strategic goals of the multiple stakeholders who are now engaged in trying to ensure collective security uh, across the transatlantic, but in specifically, how should we think about the ways in which the United States versus Europe versus the Nordic uh, nations that are now engaged in NATO, um, how are they all thinking about what um, the strategic ends look like for Ukraine? So let me start first uh, with Colonel Helle. Thank you for having me here today and uh, wearing uniform. I must say for the start that I'm rep not representing my governmental, government's official view. My views are mine, not even my wife shares with them with me. <laughs> so uh, 
that gives me at least a little bit of flexibility. Uh, there's, so the strategic end state in, in, in the war in Ukraine, from the Ukrainian point of view, it is clearly to restore the borders of 1991, and they are not willing to level anything less than that. And, and their willingness to uh, fight against the aggression has shown the world that they are committed to that end. And I believe because of their strong resistance and fight, Moscow would have to reassess their end state. And if their end state in the beginning was to uh, basically conquer Ukraine, uh, knowing how things are moving in the battlefield, they would perhaps, and this is my personal view, they would have to come up with a situ uh, end state where the, the rest of the world, from the Moscow's point of view, would be accepting Crimea as part of Russia, but everything else they would be able to, or they would be willing to kind of give up in Ukraine. Uh, but as I said, Ukraine is not ready for that. But uh, this is uh, my understanding. Now, uh, for NATO, for EU, this has been a question of commitment. For the US, it has been a question of commitment. And over the past, let's say, six months, I have fortunately not seen any change. In other words, all those stakeholders are very committed to continue. I leave it here, and I think we continue. Ingrid? All right, thank you. Uh, and thank you, New America. Dr. Slaughter, who just came in, uh, Ben and the others, and of course, all the Finnish friends in the room. It's great to be with you and to have this very timely conversation today. Uh, there are so many things to say, I'm not sure where to start, but I guess uh, for us, of course, what has happened this past year shows that we have a big neighbor to the east that has shown contempt for uh, international uh, law and uh, a rules-based world order. And of course, our end strategic goal cannot be any other than to show as an as an uh, European partner and ally uh, to uh, a partner to Ukraine and to show that uh, European borders cannot and will not be shifted by military force in this way. We have to do everything to prevent that from, from happening because of course it will have repercussions also for us if we show that this is the new norm uh, in any way or form uh, that cannot be accepted. And that's why it's so important that we continue to cooperate on this also across the Atlantic uh, with uh, the United States and all our partners in the world to, to push back Russia at this point in time. So I'd ask you the same question. What, what, what do you see in terms of the strategic end states and, and goals for each of the stakeholders yeah. here? Thank you. First of all, thank you for inviting me to be part of this really interesting conversation. And again, uh, uh, the opinions that I will express here today do not represent the opinions of the RAND Corporation. Uh, um, I think that the question is really interesting, and I think uh, I wanted to highlight another aspect that I've been thinking about. I think the, the question of strategic aims and goals, there's also the question of, um, this is essentially a question of war termination. Um, and in terms of war termination, we do discuss a lot the territorial aspect of war termination. And that is, of course, very important. But I think we also need to look beyond the positional question, the positional aspects of war termination. And with that, what I really mean is, um, is signaling that um, you know, there is full support for Ukraine and the Ukraine and that also the West is really in it for, for years, really, for as long as it takes for Russia to stop the war. And when you talk about war termination, I think uh, a very important aspect of that is when we do have a war termination state, it is very important for us to also be convinced 
that the war will not continue in a year or two, that it will not come back. So I think that is, that is a, a question that I think when we do think about the strategic goals and, and what is the end state of the war. So Angela, I know you've got something to say about this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm gonna run through all of the countries that we, uh, we talked about before. So let me begin with the United States. I mean, the Biden administration has not been clear about uh, you know, how, uh, what its stakes are and how it thinks the war should end. All it will say is that Ukraine should still be a sovereign nation with territorial integrity, but it doesn't talk about actually what that territorial integrity is. And I'm not aware that the European Union as a whole has formulated a view of this either. Maybe some individual countries um, have. So um, I think it's very difficult. I mean, we know now that the Biden administration is certainly not pushing the Ukrainians to negotiate with the Russians. I mean, we're way far away from that. Um, but I, I think they've been maybe deliberately ambiguous about it. Um, and every time one tries to sort of nudge them in that direction, they don't want to say anything. I'm not sure how helpful that is. I, I'm not sure that this um, creative ambiguity helps that much, but I guess because there's so many, many unknowns, they haven't done it. Now on Russia, I would respectfully disagree um, with what my colleague has said. I do not think Russia at this moment would, would be willing to withdraw its troops as long as it gets uh, you know, recognition that Crimea is part of the Russian Federation. I mean, Putin started this war to conquer all of Ukraine and change the government. And those, that final aim has not uh, disappeared. It's just that obviously the Russians have done so badly on the battlefield that it's taking them much longer and they may never do it. Um, but I don't see any sign um, that, that he's willing to do it because I think if he were, then there would have been signals at least already sent about this and the signals we get from Russia about negotiations is we'll negotiate when the Ukrainians surrender completely. Um, and by the way, we don't really want to negotiate. I mean, uh, Dmitry Peskov, the uh, press secretary said that the other day. And then uh, finally, China. So this is interesting. We know that Xi Jinping does not want Russia to lose this war. Um, he wants Putin uh, or someone like Putin to stay in power, who can be a fellow autocrat, heavily dependent on China now. Um, and, and that is why we, we saw him uh, go to Moscow, and that's why he said the things he said. And we, you know, we don't know what Xi and Putin discussed in the four hours they had alone the day before they had the public discussions. Uh, but we think, and there are uh, some leaks about this, that they in fact did talk about the provision of weapons. So I think the Chinese stake is not to see Russia lose, um, but um, not to have the conflict spread any further. Um, those are the, that's what we've seen so far. Yeah, go ahead. On, on China, I would continue that in their interest, uh, it is to continue waging this war as long as possible, because it is attrition to the West, and it's in certain ways attrition definitely, and actually in many ways to Russia. So the weaker those two elements, the West and Russia, are the better for China. So they would balance their moves to make this war continuous as long as possible. It's interesting. I, I want to sort of pull in a couple of threads that I heard here um, and just make a, a little comment about, about Russia and, and maybe you know, some perspective, additional perspective on, on ends, ways, and means, means there. Um, I mean, I, I think that I would rather agree with you, Angela, that uh, it's not really just about Putin, right? I mean, we often talk about Putinology and it's really become a little bit of a disease in, in, the, in the blob and how we think about uh, foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis Russia. Um, there's an in entire oligarchy that really depends on the system being uh, as stable as it can be. It is now increasingly unstable. Uh, I think we greatly underestimate that, the, the, the level of instability there, uh, but we're starting to see the cracks, right? And the biggest cracks that we can talk about, and you know, I think everybody knows about it, uh, clearly is being shown through this uh, ultra-nationalist um, schism that is occurring between Yevgeny Prigozhin uh, and even, even recently Alexander Dugin, so-called Putin's brain, uh, wrote a love letter uh, to, to Prigozhin saying how uh, Russia needs to Wagnerize its military, which is really a very frightening prospect if you think about it, um, but also maybe speaks to an inflection point for the internal dynamics of Russia uh, that right now in Washington have not been fully considered um, in terms of where we're going next. Uh, it really doesn't matter if it's Putin at this stage uh, who's in charge. I mean, it's helpful uh, to have the 
the mantle of the czar uh, continue as, as such, but uh, I think the system is what it, it is. Sistema is sistema. Um, so uh, having said that, there are some additional dynamics that I think on the China front that are worth considering that I also want to pull out because I think you both alluded to this question. Uh, you know, China does not need to see uh, a, a disintegration of Russia. Uh, cannot afford to, to have that uh, in the near term or in the long term. And so the question is, does Xi Jinping and that apparatus understand enough the calculations of the now 31 nations that make up NATO? And I would argue that, the, that no, because we barely understand it, actually. Um, I think you know, Washington barely understands what has happened uh, with the addition of Finland and what may happen with the addition of, of Sweden. We're just beginning to understand that calculus. Uh, and I certainly would not uh, you know, wager that anybody in Beijing has a better beat on it than um, somebody in Brussels or Washington. So having said those two things, um, I want to turn to the question of war termination because I think it's a very important point that is not discussed enough. Uh, we've been you know, dancing around uh, the strate strategic interests. Um, there have been a couple of different scenarios that have been put on the table. Um, one is a demilitarized Crimea, right? Um, sort of a la the 38th parallel, North Korea, South Korea. And another is a, some sort of rump state for Russia in Donbass. Um, maybe a little bit more unified, a little bit more uh, aggrandized. So I want to put those two, and there's probably another here, which is, of course, you know, just, the, you know, victory for either, right? Um, the toppling of the government in Kyiv versus the toppling of the government of, of Moscow. So pick your poison. Um, which one appeals to you most? Let's, maybe I think the demilitarization of Crimea is the one that's least discussed, and I'd like to put that uh, first to you, Marta. Yeah, I think it's um, a really interesting question about what, is, what does victory look like is a question on everyone's minds. Um, but, I mean, the reason why I think it's a very difficult question, there are many reasons, but one is that um, I think that there is essentially a risk for the war to be a generational war, that it will simply not end that soon. And the further we go, the further it's more difficult to, to predict the future, as many of, of us know who, who try to understand what are the trends. Um, and essentially, the, yeah, what, essentially what, what could be the wins? Uh, you mentioned the, the demilitarized Crimea, the, the, what happens with Crimea, what happens with Donbass. Then we also talk about regime change. It seems like it's will be unlikely in, your, in Ukraine, at least for now, um, then, you know, or victory for Russia could also be essentially a, a political extension of Ukraine in one way or another. So not just these couple of regions, but what happens with Ukraine as such? Well, is it, does it end up going forward uh, on, you know, towards this, this past, past towards the West, um, or is there some sort of another situation? And I think that, um, you know, that's actually probably something that Russia could be interested in the longer term of making sure that Ukraine does not, uh, does not um, let's say, become closer with the West in one way or another, that it continues to have uh, influence in one way or another on Ukraine and essentially create a situation where Ukraine becomes um, also a burden on Europe. So make sure that there is, you know, disagreements within Europe about the future of, in Europe and the West in general, about uh, support to Ukraine. Um, so, those are some of my thoughts on, on, the, on the victory or maybe a lack of victory in Ukraine. Um, yeah, I'll stop here because I think I weird off a little bit from your question. Sure, anyone want to jump in? Demilitarize Crimea, what does that look like? How do we enforce it? What are the verification measures? Go for it. <laughs> no, well, actually I will be a, a bit of a boring panelist here because I think it's, it's not up to us to define, really. I think it's up to the Ukrainians. Uh, it's not as though this is an, an, uh, 
sort of ambiguous situation. It's completely clear that Russia bears 100% of the responsibility for this aggression. It's not like a civil war with warring parties where you might have sort of a, a situation where you need to find compromises. And as long as, I mean, that is the situation, it's up to the Ukrainians to decide what, you know, if they want to move forward towards some kind of negotiation or some kind of, of, of settlement. But as long as, I mean, I mean, for us, territorial integrity is incredibly important, and that's also what they are uh, defining as their end goal. And all we can do is to support them. So that will actually be my very brief answer to this. And I honestly think that. I mean, there are many who know the Russian political sort of or the psyche better than I do. And uh, I have a colleague who often says that uh, trying to be in, in the head of Putin is not a very healthy place to be. Uh, and uh, it's very hard to, to, you know, to see, I think, what's sort of what is the Russian calculus here. But I honestly do believe that what Russia wants here is to prevent Ukraine from being a Western oriented democratic liberal state. That's really what I think is the Russian uh, goal. And uh, if that means that they want to have a broken state or, or prevent them from, in various shapes or forms, joining the EU or other constellations that will bring them closer to, to our own community, um, yeah, that, we don't know exactly how that will be. But um, our, our, as I see our role now, both from the Swedish side, and right now I also speak for as president of the European Union, uh, it's really to support them, you know, uh, however you can to, to, to help them to preserve their in territorial integrity. All right, I'm going to come back on that the very polite mm -hmm. um, diplomatic answer there. I like that. Um, of, I'll be diplomat. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and this is live stream. That's why you're here. <laughs> um, let, let me go to Angela and then I'll, I'll pick you up. So, well, first of all, um, you know, carry on from where you left off. I mean, Putin's goal all along has been to relitigate the entire settlement of the end of the Cold War. He does not believe that the collapse of the Soviet Union is final. He said that in different venues. And so Ukraine is really part one, and probably the most immediately important part of, of revisiting the entire settlement, including, as we know from the um, treaties that were presented to NATO and the United States in December uh, of 2021, including countries like Poland. In other words, the vision is really to restore influence over a sphere of influence, uh, a sphere of control over the post-Soviet states, but a sphere of influence over the Warsaw Pact states. So I think we have to bear this in mind. This is in his mind and in the mind of people who think like him, a much longer process. Um, I mean, I think if you extrapolate what's happening now in this war of attrition that's going on where neither side has really gained or lost much territory for months, it looks as if this so-called Korean scenario could be a likely one. Um, and, that, and that might be the, the best that would be attainable for some time if both sides are willing to accept this. Um, you know, you said uh, uh, Zelensky will, uh, you know, be in power for a long time. I'm not sure that Zelensky even will remain in power if there's a Korean solution. He certainly wouldn't remain in power if there were any territorial concessions. So, but, but still, having said all of that, that might be the only thing um, that is possible. I think a rump state in the Donbass is less likely. Mm -hmm. um, just because, I mean, Russia doesn't control all of the Donbass and, and may not for some time. Okay. Having seen the level of commitment uh, in, in, by the Ukrainians, I don't believe in, 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 in the solution you, you recommended from their point of view. Just a table. Yeah. Just a table. I'm not I, recommending and, anything. And uh, <laughs> I tabled the Moscow's potential end state, uh, uh, how they would see it. But having said this, I believe that uh, uh, there is a challenge in, 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 my work, in my thoughts. And the challenge is that although Russia has already been defeated politically, I don't believe it can never be defeated militarily or economically they can continue waging this war from economical and military point of view for quite a long time. And that, that's the challenge to, to the topic. All right, I'm going to offer my own opinion. I, I'm allowed to do that as mod, mod, moderators, <laughs> moderator's privilege. Um, a couple of things that I, I would like to pick up on. Um, so I, I won't speak to the demilitarized piece. I just will say that I think that that is certainly a very, that's the greatest possibility uh, on the horizon in terms of actual termination. I don't see rump state. 
um, for a variety of reasons, chief among them, as you said. Um, it's just not an area that is very easily controlled for, you know, you can control it by depopulating it and committing a genocide, which is essentially what's occurring right now. Um, and I think that that is uh, a strategy that has certainly been uh, forwarded by, you know, uh, Shoigu and others as, a, as an option. Um, and we're seeing it. Uh, so those two, you know, are kind of out there. Rump state, no. Demilitarization, potentially, but only if Washington uh, and, frankly, Brussels and Europe uh, and, and all the other partners who are allied behind Ukraine uh, do one very important thing, which is learn a lesson from Afghanistan. Uh, and I can speak to this, I, I think, very personally, having lived there for a very long time uh, and covered that war for the better part of my career uh, for the last 20 years. Um, one mistake I saw in Afghanistan, well, I saw two very important mistakes strategically. One mistake was that the Afghans will determine for themselves the goals. Um, with all due respect, uh, the self-determination of nations is determined also by its allies uh, and its friendships and the, the commitments that that nation might make uh, to its neighbors uh, as well as to uh, its own principles and values. And I think the Ukrainians have said time and again, um, we are committed to uh, a different future than the one Putin has in mind for us. And we should listen to it. Um, and because it's being said to us very loudly um, that they believe that, <laughs> that ultimately um, our existential future is very much bound to theirs. And I think we are starting to feel this in the grocery store. Uh, when we go and buy a dozen eggs, we see uh, and when we go to the gas pump, when we turn on our heat, that this existential cordon or thread between us is very real. This is a global war uh, at this stage, yet nobody wants to declare it as yet. Um, but these things do connect us, and the Ukrainians have said very clearly, we want self-determination, but we need your help. And um, to do that, uh, we also need your help thinking about what war termination looks like, right? And so to some degree, we have to decide um, how long can we sustain uh, this effort before it becomes corrosive for our own societies. Um, and, you know, we lived through this in, with the war in Afghanistan here in the United States. The fallout from that war, two wars, 20 years, 2 million people, churning through maybe about a million deaths, easy, considering indirect deaths. The cost of that was the election of Donald Trump and an insurrection on January 6th here in Washington. So I just offer to you that self-determination is a nice idea, but it also requires us to be a little bit realistic and pragmatic about what we mean when we talk about alliances. Now, also, question about war termination a little bit further, because you talked a little bit about the question about territorial ends, um, but there's a psychological end here uh, that you alluded to. What, what does that look like? What, I mean, beyond sort of like it's over a victory party, we're, we're not going to be in 1945, you know, dancing in the streets in Manhattan and kissing sailors, right? So what, what does that look like? Um, yeah, that's a, also a complicated question, like many of your questions. Um, but I think, um, yeah, the, it makes me think about the uh, sort of democratic, democratic transition from wartime to peacetime. And there are you know, the, the concerns that are related to that part of war termination. And what does it mean for a country that has been in war for a long time to do that, right? And I'm thinking, I, I study more, you know, Europe, uh, European resistance movements and transition to peace and, and such. So I guess my remarks are based more on that sort of analysis and research. But um, so I think there's a lot uh, regarding that process that will really be reliant on uh, or be as a, a result on how, what does Ukrainian governments look like during the wartime, how well is the Ukrainian government, the state level government, but also on the level of municipalities. Ukraine is a very large state, a country. 
how well they are able to maintain democratic uh, control, democratic principles in how the country is gover governed, uh, right? Um, how, how it maintains the legitimacy of its state governance uh, structures, how well it ensures rule of law, even if you have you know, uh, mobilization going on at the same time, right? Um, so that is, you know, Ukraine has been working on the anti-corruption aspect uh, right now. Uh, a lot of that is also because we, we want to make sure that the assistance that we provide is used in a good and accountable way and actually reaches the people that really needs the assistance. Um, but then there's also the other question of, so in the longer term, as the country transitions to peacetime, um, there's the concern that um, a country could become essentially a nation of, in arms, right? It becomes a more mil a militarized society, um, which then, in, not only in terms of militarized sort of organizations, but also the whole of society, um, so that may not necessarily correspond to, let's say, the EU's requirements for, for how, how, how societies are um, and how the division between the military and security uh, organizations, for example, is uh, done, but also the, how the division between military so uh, security organizations and the civil society is uh, happening. And then... Um, some other things that, that also come to my mind, and I'm, I think that we already need to start thinking about it, like, for example, repatriation of the displaced persons, either internally, but also from abroad. So what will be the support systems for them as they're returning home? I think, um, as of August, and that is old data from, from 2022, right? There were 11 million uh, people that we were talking about. That's a lot of people. Uh, and those of them who do return, how do they, we ensure that they are able to return homes um, sort of easily? And also those of them, those of the people who do not return, how do, how do we, make, we make sure that they integrate in their new societies as well? Um, and, you know, as I was thinking down and thinking about, you know, a historic example of such a large scale repatriation, uh, very far and few between to, to have a compar historical comparison. And then uh, on the gender side, we have to talk about gender, uh, potential threat of gender balance inside of Ukraine. Mm -hmm. So it was women and children who were able to leave, men of fighting age had to stay. So what does that mean for the future, for a longer term future of Ukraine? Um, and also regional disparities. Um, Already today, we have to think, think about those regional disparities and the areas that are not occupied, where we are able to influence things. Um, but also after war, we specifically will have to think about regional disparities in uh, the areas that were occupied or had um, or really see, saw a lot of war destruction. So I see that we're almost at time, but I want to just um, actually ask our Swedish and Finnish colleague here. Uh, to reflect a little bit on, on some of this question about self-determination and, and talk a little bit about some of the internal um, debates, perhaps, or, um, you know, uh, questions that came up as uh, the, the challenge of whether to join NATO uh, was coming to the fore. Because I think, you know, in, in listening to Marta's answer here, uh, in a way, uh, the failure to join, you know, NATO would risk potentially this type of future uh, for Sweden or Finland or for other parts of the Baltic states. So I wonder what the internal debates are. And I'll, I'll turn to you, Ingrid, and then to you, Konohalo. All right, well, uh, you all know, and I don't need to tell the, the Finnish friends in the room this, how, how dramatic a transition uh, we saw in our countries after the breakout of the war, how the opinion shifted even quicker in Finland than in Sweden. Uh, but it, it was very clear that it had a very profound effect on public opinion. And for us, it, it, it basically changed uh, 200 years of military non-alignment. It's, it's quite extraordinary, actually. Uh, you have to remember that. And um, I think it all began, I mean, we, we still see, I know it's the same in, in Finland, and you will, will speak to this, but we see a very 
broad support in Parliament, not by everyone, but a, a very solid majority of the parties that, that support both membership and that support our uh, support for Ukraine, interestingly, uh, including uh, through uh, all kinds of military equipment. And you should know, I think uh, you all know in this room, but this is the first time that Sweden provides another, a country in war with weapons since 1939, when we did the same for Finland during the Winter War against the Soviet Union. Uh, support across the board, unanimous support actually, uh, by the, the, all the political parties. So, of course, we've had a debate, less now, I would say, but initially, whether, I mean, you would see in media discussion whether this would somehow affect our, you know, uh, position as, you know, confidence that we had actually earned by being a neutral nation. But then you should remember that we haven't been neutral since 1995 when we joined the European Union. It's not as though uh, Russia didn't know where our loyalties were. We've been practicing with NATO, uh, the EU, uh, or EU countries, European partners, Nordic partners, uh, through military exercises and, and in various kinds uh, since a long, long time. Uh, but still, we were militarily non-aligned and in, in a very short period of time, both Sweden and Finland decided to, to change course. And this was very dramatic. So, um, I would say, Candice, that the debate that we had was not so much as to would this provoke Russia or would this be sort of something that is not in our interest because it would be seen as a provocation. It would rather be perhaps initially, would this somehow affect our ability to be an honest broker elsewhere or, or to, to sort of use uh, sort of our position as, as, a, um, as a country without, also without colonial baggage and, and sort of being, ha having a, uh, enjoying a high degree of confidence. You don't see much of that now, actually. We still have, uh, public opinion in Sweden is, has reached, sub, I think, 67, 69% for uh, NATO members. In Finland, it's, it's even higher, uh, but it's solid. And interestingly, even with the debacle that we've had and that we still have with, with um, uh, Turkey and to one a certain extent also Hungary, those who have not ratified our, our accession, it has not affected support for NATO membership uh, in Sweden. Of course, uh, there, is, there are lots of opinions about the government's way to handle it, should we have done things differently and so forth. There is a media debate about that. But I think the overwhelming, I know the overwhelming majority of Swedes are, are, feel very confident that this is where we belong within the alliance. I think we feel it even more now with Finland a member. I mean, you look at the map, right? Uh, it's fairly clear where the missing piece is. It's Sweden, right there in the middle. You mentioned the, the island of Gotland. And of course, for us, uh, this is not just a matter of gas prices or, or general solidarity. It's a very concrete thing. I mean. Russia is very close to us. Would something happen, for instance, in the Baltic countries, we would inevitably be affected by that. Uh, it's about our own security in an extremely concrete way, really, and in, of the security in Northern Europe. And we know, both Sweden and Finland, and I'm sure you will also speak to this, that, that we will also contribute. We will be a net contributor to security within the alliance and in Northern Europe. We will make the alliance stronger, and you are already doing that. What about your debates? Uh, when it comes to la last spring, I don't need to explain it to this audience because they have been there following it more carefully than I have, but the debate was very thorough and the political process was also very thorough. And because of that, uh, actually, and this is an observation, we just had the parliamentary elections and, and foreign policy was not an issue. Mm. So it was everything else but not foreign policy. So it kind of explains that if all the parties are behind this decision and, and uh, there are other elements in the political arena to discuss and debate, but the foreign policy is not one of them. So, uh, and that's a very good sign for the future that uh, Finnish people are uh, by vast majority behind it, this decision. Very good. Well, I, I suppose we could hear from our audience here. Um, certainly we have lots of uh, expert minds uh, from Finland with us today. Uh, what are your questions and, and comments and, and concerns listening to this conversation? Please feel free to jump in. I see somebody in the back here. There's a mic right next to you. Thanks, Arturo. 
Uh, I wonder if this works. I no, don't good. think so. Could you check that mic? It's on. There we go. Okay. Uh, actually, I don't have any question, more like a comment. Number one is that um, I don't like the idea of putting any kind of equal sign between Afghanistan and Ukraine. They are totally two different cases. First of all, Afghanistan is not a nation like Ukraine is. Ukraine has economical possibilities, it has education, it has some kind of uh, democratic structures existing, even though it's highly corrupted. We all know that. The second point is that um, the only way we can affect Russian aggression is to use force. That's the only thing they respect. We have seen that through the history, that the only thing that we can do is to use force and be very decisive in our actions. We have started the process, and this is not the moment to stop it. Now it's the moment to take it to the end. What the end might be, I don't know. Uh, about uh, Crimea, I'm sorry to say, it seems to be a very difficult case to take back. Donbass area, yes, there are possibilities. However, as our attaches has mentioned, the Russians are able to take casualties and they can carry on for years to go. So my only worry here is that uh, the Western countries are getting tired in giving their support. It has been going there with drops by drop it should go there with big, big bang and, and early enough because giving small pieces of equipment, packages, doesn't help the military to build, build up proper capabilities. So I think we are in a track where we should go on and carry on. And the difference between Afghanistan and, and, um, and, and uh, Ukraine is, there is the major difference is that we have no Western boots on the ground. We are outside and the Ukrainians are doing the fighting, and we should respect that one. Indeed. I, I didn't mention the second um, lesson that was not learned from Afghanistan, which is the need for air superiority for any nation with a modern army facing another modern army. To your point, uh, that has been the one question that has not yet been resolved as to how to uh, enable the Ukrainians to have air superiority um, because that is one piece of air termination, I mean, war termination, uh, regardless of, you know, the status of Donbass and Crimea, uh, it will be an essential um, piece of the puzzle unless we want to see Kyiv fall. Other comments and questions from the audience? Well, I do want to respond on Afghanistan, but that might be a little bit long. <laughs> I'll simply say um, it is true that Afghanistan is different than Ukraine. But what they both have in common is a post-Soviet legacy. Um, and both were, at various points, um, attempted to be colonized by the Soviet Union. Uh, and the legacies are different largely because uh, Afghanistan was colonized or tried to be, you know, there were many attempts to colonize uh, Afghanistan, not only by Russia, but by uh, Britain, of course, uh, and the Persian Empire before that. Um, when you have a country that is repeatedly colonized or has an attempt uh, and then resists that, you're going to have an erosion of human capital like you've never seen before. So while I agree that there is no comparison, I think it's, it's a little bit, um, you know, injudicious to think about them as too different. Uh, there are a lot of defenders of human rights in Afghanistan uh, still there today, uh, struggling to try and get by. A lot of women in particular who are struggling to get by. Um, despite enormous privation uh, and really what is basically a gender apartheid. Um, the, the fact that Ukraine has not chosen that as their path for their future is a little bit geographic and a little bit historical. Um, but it also, um, I think, you know, to Marta's point, you, we could see something uh, on the order of a kind of gender apartheid emerge, although it will be very strange. Uh, it will look quite different, right? Um, but the one reason, you know, Afghanistan has the legacy that it has and maybe is often perceived as not a unified state, is largely because of the repeated attempts to conquer a people um, and not paying attention to the fact that all people desire to be democratically ruled um, regardless, and that they, even, even if we do not perceive them as nations uh, that are unified, um, they believe that they are. Please. On the persistence piece, uh, Ukrainians have clearly showed that they, they want to safeguard 
and maintain their independence and, and restore the borders in Afghanistan. I wasn't so sure about the Afghan people's commitment, I mean, the final commitment. So I would neither compare those too much. But when it comes to support to Ukraine, and, and then in comparison to Afghanistan and the Western support to Afghanistan, I believe uh, uh, in, in the Western countries uh, there was certain war fatigue over Afghanistan, deploying troops for, from years after years, and, and of course deploying uh, equipment as well, but mainly troops. Uh, with Ukraine, uh, I think every nation in Europe and in the West can afford the, wa the war in Ukraine. We can afford it. We can afford supporting Ukraine. Uh, so. In those terms, uh, the commitment from the Western side to support, in my logic, will continue for years and years. Other questions and comments from the audience? I know we must have some. Here we have one. Yes, thank you. Uh, Matti Mannanen from Technology Industries of Finland. And uh, I'm coming back to this position that you said, or, or, or the point that uh, Russia is trying to restore the Cold War situation in, in, in a way. And, and now, just recently, I was reading an article where uh, there was an article about the shipping armada or the fishing arm armada that uh, the, that the Russians are having, and they are they are like investigating and mapping the electric cables and 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 the communication cables and all this. So how how likely do you see that uh, these will be hit, or that how how far will the Russians go in in their like undeclared war? Would you like to answer that? Well, there's been evidence for decades uh, for, for Russian uh, scientific ships uh, doing what they, what, according to this report, they are doing. So there is, on the military side, there is nothing new about, about this news. Are they willing to do that? Are, are they ready to do something like that? I think there's already evidence in the Baltic Sea, in the, in the, also in the Atlantic, of, of the cutting cables. So, yes, that definitely that will remain as a tool in their toolbox, and they will be using it for sure. They would try to perhaps deny their attribution, but since they have already lost their kind of diplomatic, let's say, respect, there is less to lose on that side either. That's an interesting point, actually. I mean, you know, when a state reaches this kind of state of almost I wouldn't say neutrality in, in attrition, but we're getting there uh, with Ukraine and, and Russia in some ways. I mean, I think we've seen very little movement territorially, um, and I think we would have expected to see something different by now, uh, where Donbass is concerned and where Bakhmut in particular is concerned, but we haven't seen a breakthrough. Um, and I think we should expect to see more and more sort of asymmetric means uh, being deployed, uh, primarily by Russia, because they have the means to do so. Um, the question is, you know, at what stage will NATO partners begin to enable Ukraine to do the same. Um, will there be a moment when uh, allowing Ukraine some means, military or otherwise, to change the balance asymmetrically? Um, will there be a, a, a point there? What do you think, Angela? So I wanted to go back to our, uh, the first comments we had. Uh, and I agree with you. I mean, the only thing that the Russians will recognize and will respect is force. Um, and, you know, when they look back at what we didn't do in the West in 2008 when they invaded Georgia and in 2014 when they annexed Crimea, I think that emboldened Putin. What we've seen in this war is that our deterrence failed, right, the West. We tried to deter Russia. We declassified all this uh, intelligence. We showed it to our allies. We also showed, showed it to countries that are not our allies. And, you know, William Burns went to Moscow and he warned them. They still did it. But their deterrence is working on us. We are all on some level intimidated by Putin's nuclear threats. And the more he does that, the more you get these kind of worried populations for good reasons uh, in, in the West and in other parts of the world uh, that, you know, we have to restrain what we do. Otherwise, World War Three is around the corner. And I don't know how you get out of this dilemma because you cannot say definitively, well, Putin would never do that because we don't know that. But I think we have to recognize that, you know, that, that, <laughs> that Russia is deterring us and we're not really deterring Russia. And as I say, I don't know 
how you change that situation. Well, the first step of the 12 steps is to admit, right, <laughs> <laughs> that in fact this is World War III. Is that possible? I know people don't like to hear that message, but I, I do genuinely believe that we are at an interesting point in history where all of the norms, all of the rules, all of the charters, all of the treaties are now called into question. Very similar to what we had before World War II and I, where every single instrument of diplomatic engagement in every single institution, I will just note that the UN is probably one of the most broken institutions out there, um, you know, we're teetering yeah. and we are teetering. Mm -hmm. um, and we don't really have too many more pathways uh, left to us. And so to your point on the escalation risk and um, acknowledging that we're kind of there now, um, I wonder if we could future cast a little bit, and this is a dangerous thing for diplomats, I think, so I'll, I'll invite you to be as diplomatic as you need to be, um, but if we could future cast a little bit and think about the moment in which tactical nu nuclear weapons are used in the context of Ukraine, what should be the response of NATO in the United States um, and the world, frankly? You're the NATO ally. Yes, of course. <laughs> nice dodge. <laughs> um, this tactical nuclear peace has been discussed thoroughly, in, in my view. And uh, there are different opinions on, on the answer, and I'm not going to give a single answer on that one. However, what I can say is that I still believe that uh, the leaders of these nations, although they are ideologically very you know, strongly motivated, in the end there is a level of sensibility and understanding in their minds. So they would avoid using nuclear weapons as long as their existence is not threatened. And, and the war in Ukraine, even the war in Taiwan, which luckily is not taking place, it's not about existence of anything. So I'm, I stand on the positive side of, of the nuclear peace, saying that it, become, it remains a, a, a threat. But when it's an equal threat, they won't use it. All right. I sense that you maybe well, I can't speak for, for the NATO, uh, but um, <coughs> or for NATO, but no, I mean, it's uh, yet. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. In, uh, hopefully very soon. No, uh, you know, of course, it's an extremely powerful threat. It is the ultimate threat, right? Uh, and I'm not surprised that, that Putin uses it. And, uh, you know, um, I think most experts agree that it would you know, it's not very realistic because the, the costs would be so tremendous for him and also for us. But of course, we need to have this conversation. And I mean, that's a very important conversation for the Alliance to have how to respond. All right, now I'll turn to the two analysts who are not bound by diplomatic decorum. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, um, so one of the arguments, by the way, that's used is, well, you know, the Indians and the Chinese have warned Putin that if he were to do something like that, you know, there would be serious consequences. I think we all have to admit that, you know, if this is something he decides he wants to do, he's not going to be that concerned about the Chinese or the Indian response to it. Um, you know, I, I'm not going to put a likelihood, you know, statistical likelihood on this, but I think if something like that were to occur, there would be a very ro robust NATO response. And I mean, the President Biden said that, other uh, NATO leaders have said that. Um, it would clearly, well, I don't think it would be a response in kind, but it would certainly be a military response and it would affect Russian military assets. Marta? Yeah. Yeah, actually two points that I wanted to make. One is about deterrence and the other one is trying to answer your question. So first, the question about has deterrence worked? I actually think that NATO's deterrence has worked. I mean, Russia has gone to great lengths to avoid any military kind of conflict with NATO countries. Um, it hasn't even gone for the you know West Ukraine supply routes to the West. So I think that that 
that is a message towards, uh, f to us of how Russia doesn't actually want to engage with NATO in a war. Um, having said that, there are, you know, the Baltic states and Poland are, of course, concerned about any military threat. Um, military threat or also sort of uh, threats under, under the th threshold of war, right? Their threat assessment has not decreased, it's actually increased. Um, so I wanted to sort of highlight that actually NATO deterrence for NATO member states, I think, is working. And the fact that Finland has chosen to become a NATO member state, I think, is also, um, you know, a symbol of that. Um, regarding nuclear uh, use of nuclear weapons, I mean, I will also not put any likelihood on that. It's just, I think it's impossible. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, there certainly is some concern that uh, there could be a degradation of the use uh, of sort of the degradation of the taboo of the use of nuclear weapons. Right. Um, and also, and I think a, probably a concern that, maybe an even bigger concern that the um, nuclear weapons can essentially be used as a means of you know, blackmailing uh, the other parties into a certain outcome of the war. Interesting. Okay, well, I'll offer maybe a prognosis also, and, and then I'll go back to the audience. But um, so I think it's been very interesting, the conversation about the, you know, tactical nukes uh, in the context of Ukraine, whether they would be used. Uh, many people have framed the question as likelihood. I think we have to get way beyond likelihood. Um, ultimately, our job as analysts, right, uh, I think, and, and as, as policy experts is to try and predict um, the what if, not the likelihood, but the what if. Um, so let's, I want to talk about the what if and I'll just give you my sort of two fingers or my two cents as it were. Um, the what if, these are dangerous things to say out loud uh, anywhere, but there are of course um, prime targets inside of, of, of Ukraine. Uh, and I think we could name those cities relatively easily. It would not be Kyiv. Um, because that would not pay for Moscow to hit Kyiv. They haven't done so. Uh, they've been actually been very delicate in many ways, although I, I recognize that it's very relative, and that is not the way the Ukrainians are experiencing uh, you know, the war at this moment, but simply saying it from a strategic perspective, um, there are reasons why you know, Kyiv is not on the table, um, which leaves you know, some places uh, in the east, most likely, uh, for a variety of reasons, because it would give great advantage for Crimea uh, and Donbass, as a, as a hold. Uh, and I think that the Russians have shown uh, both in Chernobyl and Zaporizhia their willingness to do absolutely mad, insane things when it comes to um, trampling on ground that is uh, contaminated, um, working in areas that are very dangerous, uh, that could really be a tripwire uh, for the entire continent, if not the world. So I would certainly say that that, that is, first of all, I will say that likelihood doesn't matter. Um, we have to start thinking about what does it mean when that happens. So a couple of scenarios I just would like to throw out there. Um, things that are in the newspaper, okay, that we've all heard, nothing secret here. Uh, we've heard conventional response from uh, NATO partners. Uh, and I, I think that, um, that that is where the timing of this becomes very important because if Sweden is not yet, uh, you know, a member of NATO, then we have a very different scenario for European security going forward for the next decade or generation uh, if, in, in the instance of a tactical news being used in, in Ukraine, if that happens. If Sweden is a member, then we have a different scenario because then the conventional response becomes much more muscular um, and much more robust, much more sustainable, uh, and so forth. And so that will be a calculation for anybody sitting in the Kremlin, for sure. If I'm thinking it, they're thinking it. That's one thing to be uh, mindful of, um, because I'm just you know, an average Joe who thinks about these things. Uh, and I'm sure there are other less average Joes somewhere in the Kremlin who are thinking about these things. Um, so timing is going to be a very important piece of this. Um, and I would argue that if there is not somebody um, over there uh, across the river uh, at the Pentagon thinking about asymmetric responses, then we should all be very scared. Um, because if, if we don't have that on the, on the table, um, as an addition to conventional responses, um, then we are into a territory that I think is unprecedented. 
uh, in terms of the future of security, not of Ukraine, not of Europe, not of Russia, but of the human race. What do you mean by asymmetric responsibility? Well, I have a number of factors, <laughs> do you want, if you want to no, go I into just, it. I don't understand you mean. So, um, if you want to effectively stop um, an escalation, you need to turn off the ability to target. Well, there are options in space, right? And there are options um, in cyber. And those two combined uh, have a lot of power to shut down the ability to escalate further. But we don't know um, how much is known about the system inside of Russia, right? And there's been a lot of debates about whether or not even Russia has uh, the ability um, to, to do all the things uh, that it has, it's on plan for, for nuclear use. So I'll leave it there because I know that we're at time. Um, I think we have about two minutes left, which means um, maybe we can take one last question or comment from the audience. Christo. Right, um, maybe a quick observation, and a quick question. Uh, observation when, uh, sorry, yes. Uh, quick observation, when uh, the Soviet Union attacked Finland in 1939, it was kicked out of the League of Nations. And now when uh, Russia attacked Ukraine, it was the president of the UN Security Council, and it is again. So the future of Na uh, not only NATO, but the future of the UN, of course, is a big question. But my question has to do with timetable again for the benefit of our scenario work. And we were in Oxford uh, with this group uh, a couple of weeks ago, and to our surprise, the experts there said that by 2030, this will be over, we will be back to doing uh, diplomacy, trade, not on the same level, but nevertheless with Russia. So what's your reaction to us doing business with Russia by 2030? And of course, their thinking was that by that time, there would have been a leadership change in Russia. So any reactions to the timetable? Great question. Great question to end on, and I'll just say, um, in the classic fashion of an NPR host, you've got 30 seconds. <laughs> Go. <laughs> I would be disappointed uh, if that was the case. I would be disappointed on the Western morale. I wouldn't be a Swedish diplomat if I wouldn't also defend the UN a little bit. And I think it's interesting that what has happened, you're completely right. I mean, it's really stalled in the Security Council. But interestingly, the center of gravity has moved to the General Assembly in the UN. And there we see a very different and very solid support also for Ukraine. And also the Secretary General has been extremely outspoken. And I'll use my remaining five seconds to say that I think that the UN and potentially other bodies also could play a very important role in the matter of accountability when this is over. Uh, this is not a response to your question, but I think I needed to say it anyway. Okay, I'm actually quite skeptical. I think that uh, the, um, those opinions, I think, hinge on a quick end to war, on a belief that with regime, regime change, there is going to be a massive, let's say, democratic transition in, in Russia, which are things that I'm also skeptical about. about. I think that there is a concern, risk that we're, everyone's going to be, you know, we're, we are in this war and it can be, uh, can go on for a longer time than we would hope for. Um, and I don't necessarily think that there, there will be such a massive um, change in Russia, even if, the, even if Putin was no longer the leader, let's put it like that. Um, so... So yeah, if, if war st ends right now and we have a very big sort of reconciliation uh, movement going on, um, maybe, but otherwise, I have a lot of question marks there. I frown. <laughs> question marks and frowns. Yeah. Angela. Just briefly, I am very skeptical that there will be a government in Russia in the year 2030 with whom uh, you know, Europeans and Americans will want to do business as usual. Um, whatever happened, we don't know how long Putin will be there. If he's not there anymore, he's probably going to be succeeded by someone who shares his views. And so the idea that you will get a more kind of pragmatic group uh, and willing to reconsider relations with the West coming to power 
Eventually, one hopes that happens. But so far, most of this pragmatic technocratic elite in Russia, whom we all knew from the St. Petersburg International Economic Forum, all those places, the governor of the central bank, Hermann Greff, all these people have now accepted the war. They've buckled down, and they're supporting what Putin's doing. So I want to see the next generation of people who, in fact, would form a government with whom we would like to do business as usual. Very good. I'll just say it depends on whether we're at 1.5 degrees or 2.0 in terms of our um, emissions reductions goals. Uh, because ultimately, at the end of the day, Russia is fighting this war um, largely because of the need to shift away from hydrocarbons. Uh, its dependency on hydrocarbons for hard revenues, uh, as well as its entire military industrial complex, is a good reason for this war. There are some very material motivations. Um, and if we do not get our um, reductions of emissions uh, under control, um, ultimately, I think we will be de dealing with a very dangerous Russia, much more dangerous Russia, uh, if there is still a Russia at all. So with that, I want to thank our panelists. <laughs> and Merry Christmas. Um, <laughs> I want to thank our panelists and give them a round of applause. <laughs>